Okay, so let's we'll spread this part over two videos. We're going to talk about two main topics. One, the different types of database management systems, and then two, what the real difference between the database engine and analysis services is. Okay, so let's just get started. We'll probably make these about 10 minutes each, 15 minutes each. Uh, so let's jump in and talk about what is a database management system. Okay, so your modern DBMS is simply a software that allows for the storage, manipulation, and querying of data. Okay, it stores the data. You can change the data. You can add new. You can delete, and you can write queries against that data. Okay, it also is going to provide a way to secure access. Somebody doesn't have a username and password, for example, they won't be allowed to access the data. Or you can say only these users are able to access this table or this column or this cell or this row, for example. Business rules are enforced. These are the types of rules where you say um, this is an employee table and employee ID must be unique throughout the entire table. There cannot be duplicate employee IDs, for example. Uh, you want to be able to back up. Uh, you want to be able to restore in the event you have a uh, problem. And you also want protection from failure. Now, that may be a little bit difficult to understand. Imagine that in the middle of the day, you've got 100 users connected to a database uh, management server, and bam, power goes out. What happens when the power goes on? Is the database immediately corrupt? Well, I promise you, if you've worked in databases for a long time, you'll know <laughs> that, yes, that, that used to be a real possibility uh, with the even high-dollar uh, databases. But today, it's not likely to happen. Uh, we wouldn't just have a complete corruption. Uh, we have battery backup disk caches, uh, battery backup uh, on uh, plugged into our systems, the uninterruptible power supplies, for example. Uh, we're not likely to be in those situations, but if we do get into that situation, the databases, the management system will put in place an all or nothing uh, right uh, so that you, we'll talk about transactions a little bit later on. Okay? Uh, you want to have a query language so that you can write those queries, insert data, manipulate data uh, using a language. Uh, and many of them will have API access to where you can write uh, you know, C Sharp, Java, C++ code uh, and still access that. Uh, throughout other systems. I, I just have a bunch of the lists of different database management systems uh, that you're likely to have either worked with or come across in the modern day. Sybase, uh, Informix is really popular, DB2 is really popular, Oracle, uh, Access, Postgre, um, lots and lots of you know different database platforms. And I missed some of them here, but I think that this this probably represents 95% of the database market uh, as it is today uh, in the enterprise, okay, in small to medium and large businesses. Okay? Um, so let's talk about kind of at a high level where the DBMS sits in all of this. I told you what it does. Okay? It's a piece of software. It provides the ability to query and manipulate the data. It gives you the security, the backup, the protection, et cetera. Okay? A database has files. Okay? I don't care what system you work with. You can think back to any one of those database management systems that I showed you. They all have files at their root, right? And that's where the data is stored. Some of them will have index files. Some of them will have just data files. But they all have files, right? Well, the way a database management system works, the user is not able to access that file directly. And they can't just go directly to that file and start working with data. They have to go through the database management system. And I tried to make it somewhat nested here so that you can kind of see if Mary wants to go use a database on Microsoft SQL Server. Okay? She's in the operating system, so she has to log into the operating system. Then she has to go to the database management system. She has to authenticate to the database management system. That's part of the security. Then she has to say, I would like to use this particular database. Now in the Microsoft SQL Server world, one DBS can have N databases, okay? So a, a single instance of Microsoft SQL Server, we might have 200, 300, 1,000 databases 
on that. That's going to be very different from some of the other platforms that you're working with, like Oracle, where a database is, that's what you're doing. You're dealing with schemas instead of, right? It's a little bit different here in the Microsoft SQL Server world. Only then is Mary able to access the data in that database. She never actually goes down and says, I want to get this from this particular file. She goes through the Microsoft SQL Server software to use it. Now, she's probably going to use some sort of API access and then write queries and all that stuff happens behind the scenes for her. But that's kind of how it works. She doesn't ever go down to the physical files. She goes through the database management software. Okay, And that's going to work for the database engine. It's going to work the same way for the analysis services engine as well. Right? Now, it's technically incorrect to say SQL Server is a DBMS. Now, the reason behind that is somewhat what we talked about in the last video. SQL Server 2012 is a suite of products. It's not just one thing, right? Reporting services isn't a DBMS, nor is integration services, okay? So there are two database management systems in the SQL 2012 suite, the database engine. When people say SQL Server, that's probably what they're talking about. But then there's analysis services, okay? So... It's difficult, actually, to understand for a new person the difference between them. Okay. So that answer, when would I use each, or the answer to that, requires an understanding of how the data is going to be used, the performance requirements that the users are going to have, the physical limits of the hardware, and the types of databases that you're going to encounter. So there's a lot of different things that go into having an understanding of what the difference is between the database engine and the analysis services engine and understanding when you would use each, okay? So let's, let's try to throw some, I prefer specific and concrete examples rather than general things. So let's use a concrete example. Our first user story is about Steven. Steven's been an Amazon.com customer since 1998. He purchases over 50 items a year from Amazon and considers himself a bit of a power user. Right? His usage patterns, how he uses the data, he shops for new products, he purchases those products, he reviews his recent order history, and he also reviews his older history infrequently. Okay? Maybe once a year at Christmas or holidays, he wants to look back to see what he bought somebody the previous year, okay? Now, when we ask these types of questions, we need to talk about the performance requirements. We're using performance requirements to come up with a, an SLA, a service level agreement, okay? SLAs are very important to database administrators and project managers. They define the contract, if you will, that says how quickly that a particular query, for example, must be answered. So what are Stephen's expectations for when he's shopping for new products? In other words, what's his patience level? <laughs> Another way to think about it, right? When he clicks on a link, how long is he going to wait for that page to load? Okay. And remember that query execution going out and retrieving the data from the database and returning it to the client is but one part of serving a web page. Okay? So we have to, if, if we say, well, Stephen will wait three seconds for a new page, well, then query execution is a fraction of that, right? That might only be, we might have to say one second max per query, okay? which would actually be pretty long. Okay? So one second. Okay? That's how long a query is able to run maximum. And then we would have target times, but this would be our maximum that we would have. Now, during the purchase process, we have a, a bit of a different way that he's working with the database. He's adding things to the cart. He's entering uh, credit card information, address into a form, right? So he's going to have expectations to finish a page. And, you know, let, when he clicks the submit button, he's going to expect that in one second, it comes back and says your order was accepted. Okay? Now, I think most users are aware that when they're reviewing order history, that may take a little bit longer. Okay? So we might actually be able to get away with a two-second order history 
we've got their money, right? We've created the contract with them, so to speak. So they might, uh, they might be okay waiting an extra second. And I, I think also in 2012, 2013, most people are understanding when they go to view an archive that that's going to take a little bit longer. So we might be able to get away with as much as 10 seconds for this. It's important to understand the SLA, to understand the usage patterns and performance requirements when we're coming up with our, when should I use the database engine or when should I use analysis services, right? Now, Stephen is a typical OLTP user. Good acronym to learn, okay? This is one that you definitely want to keep track of and know, okay? Online transaction processing, okay? OLTP workloads are identified by short and fast queries that query many tables. And when we talk about relational databases later on, we're going to see that the relational design process usually ends up with lots of tables. You get this huge explosion of tables uh, when, you, when you often go through a relational design. You're going to have a lot of data manipulation. Uh, I once read a statistic uh, that you had something like five reads to every write. Oops, I've run off my page there. Okay. So for every, you know, five rows read for every one row written. Oh, that, I, it's been, oh gosh, I bet 12 years since I last read that, and I've just been quoting it at all my training sessions since. But So I, I have no idea what it is today. <laughs> but that just gives you an idea of what I mean when I say lots of data ma manipulation. Um, you're going to have a lot of changes to this data. People are adding things to a shopping cart. They're removing things from a shopping cart. They're updating quantities. They're updating their address. Okay, they're adding new accounts, et cetera, all right? The OLTP databases are going to be optimized for satisfying a large number of queries per second, okay? Uh, and speed is absolutely critical for an OLTP database, okay? This is one of the most important things. And we use these all the time. An OLTP database that you might be familiar with would be uh, SAP or Salesforce.com, any of your... Uh, enter enterprise resource planning solutions, ERP solutions. Your CMSs, your customer, uh, I said CMS, that's the wrong acronym, customer relationship management. A CMS would also be an OLTP. <laughs> I'll fix that uh, here. Uh, your operational monitoring software, uh, any of the types of software that you deploy in the enterprise that will go out and collect statistics uh, on um, you know, how many widgets per second are passing by a uh, monitoring station. Uh, you're looking for defects uh, you know, on a, uh, a hardware manufacturer. Uh, you're looking for uh, temperature issues at a robotics plant. Right? Those are uh, situations where you have sensors placed out in the field and they are reporting back to a centralized database. There are tons of writes. Right? It's writing. You know, it's writing all the time. Web analytics, a company like Amazon.com is going to have a ton of what we call click-through analytics. They are the pages that somebody clicked after they clicked this page. And they're trying to do predictive behavior and analysis so that they can show you the things you are most likely to buy. Okay. Case history tracking, particularly common uh, with patients, uh, hospitals, uh, lawyers, uh, right, you're looking patient treatment and visits. Right, these are all situations where you need super fast queries, but you're also doing a lot of data manipulation. You're adding insurance records, you're adding visits, uh, but you you constantly need to be able to read this web storefronts, web forums and bulletin boards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We use these all the time. Okay, they need to have short, fast queries, and we need to be able to manipulate the data all the time. Okay, that's OLTP. Okay not more complicated than that. And you can kind of identify, here's just sort of a, uh, you might even know what Mad Libs are. I don't know. I know I grew up with Mad Libs. Uh, if uh, you're outside of the States or you haven't seen what Mad Libs are, they are funny stories that you are given, it's kind of a pattern, and you have to fill in the blanks, and then you, you make up a story, and it's really fun. So, sorry. Anyway, sidetracking here. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, in a case of, a web forum. Let's just use this here. In a web forum, what are users adding new? They're adding new posts. 
They're adding new replies. Uh, they're adding new accounts. Okay? They're modifying their posts. They're modifying their profiles frequently. Uh, they would review new threads, new posts, new members. Uh, they may review the older threads infrequently. Okay? And they will have high performance expectations. That is your OLTP usage pattern. Okay? And you could just swipe this out, erase all of that, and say you wanted a patient tracking. Okay? So users, uh, which would be the staff, okay? users are adding new patients, new case history. Okay? Now, Amazon's problem is going to be that Stephen is one of over 100 million customers. Okay? He has these super fast performance requirements. His orders are a small piece of the whole puzzle for Amazon.com, right? Every one of those 100 million plus users has the same expectations that Stephen does. And not to mention, when it gets to be Amazon's busy season, which would be uh, for certain uh, the Christmas season, then every user still has those same performance requirements. The user, the end user, doesn't care whether it's December the 24th, the day before Christmas, or whether it's February the 13th, the day before Valentine's Day, or just some random day like July the 2nd. Okay? They don't care. They expect one second, one second, two seconds, ten seconds. Okay? Now, how many trillions of rows has Amazon collected since 95? Okay, I have no idea, but I can kind of group together their probable big sections. All of that website usage and tracking for those 100 million people. How many trillions of rows is that? Okay, I mean, good gracious, they must be in the 100 trillion rows and up maybe, maybe 20 times that. I don't really know. But you know that that is a, li a large portion of their data. All of the order history and all of those detail rows, member demographics, age, name, address, um, uh, you know, gender, uh, buying habits, all of that kind of stuff, all the tracking that they have to do, the RFID tag so that they can pro uh, provide you with tracking information. They have to keep track of their inventories, their stock levels, where which warehouse has what. They certainly have those sensors in the warehouse that are constantly feeding back temperatures and such like that to a centralized database, right? That's just all trillions and trillions of rows. Product details, product reviews, the discussions for product. They just have huge, huge databases. And yet, all 100 million users still have those same performance requirements, right? So Stephen's usage patterns, that's a big thing. They're, Stephen's going to leave Amazon and go somewhere else if they change and start now taking 10 seconds per page, okay? Every bullet point must look through at least a trillion rows, going back to that previous page, the web tracking, et cetera. Okay? The problem, hey, stick with me, the problem here is that we have so many rows to go through, there's no way we can satisfy Stephen's performance expectations. Okay? Certainly not at uh, a busy time. Okay? So here's the idea. Okay? Is Amazon using just one database to store their data, or are they sharding this? Or are they splitting this into multiple databases? Because okay? if we have one big database, and let's just call it... Um, one petabyte, okay? And so we have 100 trillion rows of click-through rates and click-through uh, analytics, and we have 100 trillion rows of order history and 100 trillion rows of product descriptions and discussions and all the things that go into a product page, right? There's no way we can slice and dice through a petabyte of data and still get to where Stephen is able to get his stuff in one second. It just can't happen. The modern hardware today can't keep up. Okay? We might have, gosh, I don't know, 5,000 disks that are arranged in RAID and make up this one database, but we still would not be able to, with one petabyte, serve that data fast enough for Stephen. Okay? So if that's not the solution, how do Amazon's engineers solve this? They realize... Instead of having to go through 100 trillion rows, what if they only had to go through 10 million rows? Then, 
okay, through their own analysis, they've decided, okay, if we just have to go through 10 million rows, we'll be able to satisfy Stephen's expectations. So their decision, their strategy for solving this problem is to move the old data to a separate database. Okay? So instead of the one big database, okay, what percentage of this database is recent data? Data changed within the last, let's just call it, um, I don't know, what, 90 days? Is that what recent means to you? 180 days? 30 days? Okay, something like that, right? What percentage of this database? They've been around now for 15, 20 years almost at this point. It's a fraction, isn't it? I mean, it's like this little, it's, it's that button right there right? <laughs> if, we're, if we're thinking of this as an infographic, right? It's that size of it. It's a super small percentage, okay? So they want to now splinter this or shard this, and here's the new plan, okay? This is the new data, okay? So this is the 90 days OLTP data, and this is the old data, Okay, the older than 90 days. Okay? So now this is, uh, I don't know, 0 0.99 petabytes, and this is now 0 0.01 petabyte. Okay? So maybe it was 1% of that entire database set up here. Okay? Now, what, do you, what you notice about this, and I'm kind of going along, and I will apologize here, but is that this data is primarily static. Okay? Once a data, once a row has moved beyond the 90 days, it's probably not changing, right? If, for example, somebody made an order in 1999 and it's 2012 today, are we going to go back and change that order? Probably not, right? So this is more static data, okay? And it has a new term. It's called the data warehouse, okay? It contains historical data. Okay, data that probably is not going to change. And you can see in my little graphic here that uh, I made it 60 days here. Okay, so 60 days. This would be our business rule. All data older than 60 days is moved from the OLTP to the data warehouse. Okay, and the data warehouse has a different usage pattern. Okay, the data warehouse is huge. Okay, but the reports against that infrequent queries are run against the data warehouse. All queries for data older than 60 days are going to be run against the data warehouse, okay? Now this is called an OLAP. We want to do analytics with our older data. We wanna say, what were the sales like for the past 10 quarters, okay? We want to compare our sales. We want to analyze, we want to predict. Okay? And we do that by looking at the historical record. And the online, uh, sorry, the data warehouse is the historical record for a company. Okay? So OLAP databases have a very different usage pattern. These are long-running queries. They don't query that many tables, but they query perhaps trillions of rows. Okay? There's almost no data manipulation by the end users. It is mostly going to be a read-only database from an end-user standpoint. Okay? It's optimized for those large queries rather than the short, speedy, fast queries that an OLTP is. Okay? Speed is not as important here. Okay? We understand that reporting needs typically are longer-running queries than when somebody's trying to buy something. Okay? These are used for reporting. They're used for analytics. Okay? All right, I'm sorry. I, I don't like to go beyond 20 minutes. We went a little bit long here, but we needed that foundation so that we could understand the difference between the database engine and the analysis services.